see you in God's house. This morning, turn in your Bible to the book of John, John chapter 1. I'll be reading verses 1 through 5. But I want to speak to you just a little bit this morning about from God to man. There's so many marvelous miracles that Jesus did. There were so many miraculous things that God the Father provided. But one of the ones that is the most miraculous and the most astounding to me is one that's most overlooked. And that's the fact that Almighty God chose to become mortal man. What a mystery. How can we understand that? You know what? Throughout the ages, man has always wanted to become God. Man does everything he can do to act like God, talk like God. He'll tell you what you ought to do like God. There's all kinds of ways that man tries to be God. But listen, throughout the ages, there was never a God that chose to be a man. There wasn't a God that chose to be a human being, that chose to live in a life of human physical form and have the limitations that we all have as human beings. But we have a God that chose to become a man. When you talk about men wanting to be gods, I thought about President Lyndon Baines Johnson. I know there are some people here that can remember President Johnson. Some of our younger people can't. But President Johnson was known to be quite a man of steadfast demeanor. He wanted what he wanted, when he wanted it, how he wanted it, where he wanted it. And he lived his life that way. Down south here in Texas, there's a ranch. It was called the LBJ Ranch. And while he was president of the United States, it was known as the Texas White House because President Johnson cherished his ranch. And he liked to come down to Texas, and he liked to spend time on his ranch. And he had this this strange quirk that he always tried to get away from his Secret Service agent. He didn't want them following him around. He didn't want, and they were always there because they had to be there by law. But President Johnson tried to find all kinds of ways he could when he came down to the LBJ ranch to get away from his Secret Service agents. So one day he had come down and he managed to get away from them and he slipped them and he got in his pickup and he got out on the highway and he was driving into town and a state trooper observed that he was speeding. And caught him on radar. So the trooper, man, he wheeled around. He threw on the red lights and the siren. And he got behind that pickup truck. And directly, President Johnson pulled over to the side of the road. And the trooper got out of his car. And he came up to the window. And as he came up to the window of the truck, he looked and he saw who it was. And the trooper said, oh, my God. And President Johnson looked at him and said, and don't you forget it. From the beginning of time, man has wanted to be God. I think about the story of Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego when they were told that they had to bow down their knee to King Nebuchadnezzar because, you see, King Nebuchadnezzar wanted to be God. He wanted to be viewed as God. He wanted to be worshipped as God. And he put out the proclamation and the edict that unless you bent your knee to King Nebuchadnezzar, you'd be thrown in the fiery furnace. You see, he had delusions of grandeur to be God. But loved ones, as I've already stated this morning, there's only one God that ever became a man. We have just come through the Christmas season. And in the Christmas season, we should be, although I'm afraid We don't, but we should be celebrating the birth of the God-man, the God that came to earth in physical form as a small child. It's a miracle. King Solomon once stood in the temple and he declared in 1 Kings chapter 8, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. 
how much less this house that I have built. God's word is full of names that were given to Jesus Christ. But to me, one of the most meaningful names that was ever given to Jesus is Emmanuel. God with us. God left the heavenly realm. He came to the physical realm. So today, let's explore the meaning and let's explore what it means to you and I in our lives. That we have a God that chose to become a man. John chapter 1 verses 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has overcome it. The first thing we need to notice this morning about this God that became a man is we need to see the revelation of Jesus. Look in verse 1. In the beginning. He didn't say in the middle he didn't say when it was politi politically expedient. He didn't say when everybody felt good about it. He said, in the beginning, and loved ones, listen to me, the beginning is a revelation. What was that revelation? Jesus is the Word. Now, I want you to pay attention to the verb tense in that particular scripture. It says, the Word was with God. Was tells us there's an eternal existence. Was tells us that before we ever perceived, it was reality. Was tells us that Jesus is present with the Father. Was tells us that it wasn't because of the Big Bang, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later. But was tells us that Jesus Christ always existed. I go back to the creation account in the book of Genesis. When the word of God says, and it states it very clearly, let us create man in our image. God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son. At the Tower of Babel, when it looked as though man were going to come together and bring their collective efforts together and build the Tower of Babel and try to supplant God, read the account when the God's Word clearly says, let us go down and there confound their language. Unless anything they could imagine would be available to them. Let us go down. God the Father, God the Son. Listen to me this morning. Jesus has always been present. Jesus was always with God the Father. Jesus had a part in everything that the Father did and was part of everything that the Father prescribed for mankind. He not happened. He is. An eternal ex existence. Jesus never became. He didn't originate. He wasn't created. He's not an afterthought of the Father. He's eternally perceived, eternally conceived, and eternally received. And a revelation is a declaration. In John chapter 1, we have a declaration. It was God. It is God. It's forever God, and it's eternally God. Our text is a revelation of Jesus' journey from God to man. And three words describe his transformation from the heavenly to the physical. Make note of these words. First of all, notice his incarnation. Incarnation comes from the Latin word incarne, which means in the flesh. Jesus Christ came from heaven to earth in the flesh. 
It describes a transformation of a fleshly creation. Verse 14 says, the word became flesh. That's his incarnation. It's a profound statement. Just think of this. Almighty God, Jesus Christ, with God the Father, who spoke the world into existence, who spoke the galaxies into existence, who hung the sun and the earth and the moon in the sky, Jesus Christ chose to come to earth in fleshly form. He left his glory. He loosed his heavenly connections. He left the Father, and he became flesh and bone just like you and me. Listen to me this morning. Jesus is not some phantom spirit. Jesus is 100% God, and he was 100% man. Jesus got hungry. He got thirsty. He got lonely. He labored. He laughed just like you and me. God came down to man's level. Why in the world would any God do that? Hear me this morning. So he could identify with us. Because he loves us. Every hurt that you've ever felt is known by Jesus. Every mental anguish that you've ever suffered was suffered first by Jesus. Jesus came down in fleshly form so that you and I could have the assurance that he understands. How many times do you hear people say, oh, you just don't understand. You just don't understand my life. You just don't understand my problems. You just don't understand this issue and that issue. Listen, I may not understand, but I promise you my Jesus understands. He came in fleshly form so that he could identify with you and me. He not only came to identify with us, he came to instruct us, and then after he instructed us, he came to inspire us. Jesus experienced trials, tribulations, troubles. Jesus even got tired. Amen. Anybody here ever get tired? Jesus got tired. John chapter 4 verse 6 says, so Jesus, wearied as he was, tired as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. In John chapter 11, Jesus cried at the death of his friend Lazarus. And I want you to know this morning, they were not mythical tears. Jesus cried literal tears. He bled literal blood on the cross of Calvary. His heart literally stopped. He went into a literal physical death at the cross of Calvary. This is profound. Every experience that you've ever known is known by Jesus. And I submit to you this morning that one of the greatest mysteries in the world is that God would become man. In the book of 1 Timothy chapter 3, it says, Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifest in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by the angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and hallelujah, taken up into glory. We need to understand our God can identify with mankind. The Old Testament predicts the return of God as a king, but also as a man. Isaiah chapter 53 says, He was despised and rejected by men, a man, a man, get that, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. As one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6 says, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. So was Jesus a God or, or was Jesus a man? Both. Amen? According to God's word, he was 100% God, 100% man. In Luke chapter 2, we're given really the only story about the childhood of Jesus. 
When he was 12 years old, his family had taken him up to Jerusalem to the Passover feast. Mary and Joseph left for home, and they left with a crowd, so they just assumed that Jesus, the 12-year-old boy, was with them. They got more than a day away before they realized Jesus wasn't in the crowd. Their son was missing. Can you imagine how mom and dad feel? Can you imagine what went through their mind that their boy was gone? that they didn't know where he was, and they immediately began to search for him. They searched and they looked for over three days. Three days they looked for that boy Jesus, the 12-year-old son. And you know what? They found him. They found him in the temple. Luke chapter 2 verse 46 says, After three days they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and asking questions. Amen? A 12-year-old asking the rabbis about God's Word. If we stop and put that in a simple perspective, that would be like a 12-year-old child tutoring the pastor on transformative regeneration. Amen? But that's what was taking place with Jesus in the temple. Imagine the questions that the rabbis asked him. I'm sure that one of the rabbis said, Jesus, young man, how old are you? Now, can you imagine the answer? Jesus, who's 100% God and 100% man, could have answered, well, on my mother's side, I'm 12 years old. But on my father's side, I'm older than my mother, and I'm the same age as my father. Figure that out. Do you think he might have had the rabbis scratching their head a little bit? They could have asked him, do you get thirsty? And he could have said, I get thirsty on my mother's side, but on my father's side, I'm the water of life. They might have asked him, Do you get hungry? And he would say, I get hungry on my mother's side, but I'm the bread of life on my father's side. When Lazarus died, Jesus wept on his mother's side, but he brought him forth in victory and life on his father's side. When Jesus had to carry the cross down the Via Della Rosa on his back and on his shoulders, and he felt the heavy crushing weight, he could have fallen under the weight on his mother's side, but he carried the weight of sin and mankind on his father's side. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. He died on a rugged cross on his mother's side, but listen, he rose to victory on his father's side. Amen? A hundred percent God, a hundred percent man. And the incarnation of Jesus proves to us he's all God and he's all man. So the word incarnation describes Jesus, but listen to the other word, identification. The incarnation and the identification. Look at John chapter 1. And the word became flesh. And dwelt among us. Wow. He identifies with us. He identifies with our happiness. He identifies with our sadness and our sorrow. He identifies with our peace. He identifies with our trials and our troubles and our tribulations. I'm glad that he's incarnated and praise God. I'm glad he identifies with me. He dwelt with us in the flesh. Dwelt comes from the word tabernacle. And the word tabernacle, I thought it was kind of interesting when I was studying for this message. A tabernacle in biblical days was literally a tent. So you really could say in this passage of Scripture, God became human so he could camp out with men. Yeah, technically that's what it says. Listen, loved ones, we need to remember today, God doesn't watch us from a distance. He's not disconnected. 
He's never disoriented. And in Exodus chapter 25, it says, Let them that make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. Jesus is here. Jesus is part of us. Jesus is among us. He's alive and he's well. Where does Jesus live? He lives right here. He lives right now. He's eternal and he's supernal. And I love God's word when he said, I am. Not I was, not I will be, I am. I'm everything you need. I'm all that you need. I am in complete control of everything that you need. The incarnation was when Jesus entered man's world. But listen, the identification is when he entered my life. Amen? Not only did he enter the world, he entered me. He entered mankind. He chose to be with us. Now listen, I don't know how wonderfully and saintly all of you are. But I can't imagine him wanting to live in me. I can't imagine him wanting any part of me, to be honest with you. And there was a time in my life that I'm almost certain he did remove his hand momentarily from me. Just so I could understand what it was going to be like without him. Praise God I came home. Amen. I saw what it was like without him. And without the identification of Jesus in our life, we're lost. We're degenerate. We have no help and we have no hope. So we see his incarnation. We see his identification. But there's a third word. I want you to look at his illumination. Verse 14, and we have seen his glory. And then it goes on to say, glory as the only son from the Father. That's illumination, amen? Jesus is the glory of the Father, and he represents the glory of the Father here on earth. He's the glory of creation. He's the glory of personification. He's the glory of dedication, acclamation, representation, interpretation, reconciliation, orientation, communication, consideration, configuration, and praise God, transformation. Amen. That's my God. He's the glory of the Father. And listen, let me ask you this morning. Have you ever beheld his glory? Has he ever moved in your life? Has he ever moved obstacles out of your life? Has he ever picked you up when you couldn't pick yourself up? That's the glory. That's the glory of Jesus Christ manifest through God the Father on earth. I beheld his glory. And listen, I have it in good authority from God's word. When you behold his glory, It'll change your life. It'll turn you around. It'll turn you upside down. You remember a few weeks ago we prayed and, and we, we taught a sermon and a message from God's Word that talked about the fact that the early church turned the world upside down? The glory of God. The glory of God turns my life upside down. That's an illuminating experience. I remember the story of Jesus in the Bible when he did his very first miracle. When he turned the water into wine. And listen, I, I can't help this. I, I can't get on with old fogey fundamentalism that says, oh, that was great juice. The Bible said at the wedding they drank that wine and said, wow, we've never had any wine this good. We've never, most people, when they invite you to a party, you know, they don't give you the good stuff last. They give you a little bit of it at the first, and you get the garbage at the last. But they even made the comment, wow, Jesus created wine out of water, and he gave us the best. 
the very best that he had. Listen to me this morning. The glory of God the Father shone on the cross at Calvary, and he gave you and me his best. We should give him our best. How dare we give him anything less? John chapter 2 and verse 11 says, The first of his sign Jesus did in Cana and Galilee and manifested his glory. I remember when Jesus was called to the tomb of Lazarus, his friend, who had died and been laying there in the, in the tomb for four days, and the Bible said he already stunk. And Jesus came on the scene. John chapter 11, verse 43, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus walked out of the grave. That's illumination. That's the glory of God. And the illumination of Jesus was evident at the cross of Calvary when Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And hear me this morning. The illumination is evident today. Because Revelation 21.5, here's that, that passage of Scripture that I brought you last week. And I'm going to hit on it again. Because, see, we want to be free in 23. And if we're going to be free in 23, we need to remember Revelation 21.5. Behold, I make all things new. Are you unhappy with who you are? Let him make you new. Are you unhappy with what you do, where you go, where you've been, who you associate with, the trials and tribulations of life that keep you bent down? Listen to me. Behold, I make all things new. And then he said, write this down. How many of you last week wrote that down? Oh, good. 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 Because you see, I'm not the one that told you to do that. God's Word said it. Revelation 21.5, he said, write this down. Because these words, they're trustworthy and they're true. In our message last week, we touched on the passage of Scripture that said, don't be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I debated on this, but I know it's okay because I know the people involved and I love them. And they love me. And it's okay to have differences of opinion. But let me tell you, it's not okay to have differences with God's Word. See, this is not an opinion. This is the truth. And last week I preached that scripture that said, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And after church, immediately after preaching this message, I had someone say, how come we can't have Easter egg hunts sponsored by the church? Transforming our mind? Maybe? Maybe? Don't be conformed to the world. The goddess of fertility has nothing to do with my Savior. The goddess of fertility and bunny rabbits and eggs have nothing to do with Jesus Christ and His blood that was shed on Calvary. It's an affront to my Savior. And I have to tell you that. As your pastor, I have to tell you that. Not saying that we can't do relevant things to reach out to other people and bring them in our fold. But listen, God's Word is not up for debate. It's not up for conjecture. And it should not rely on our opinion. God said, our minds need to be transformed. The illumination calls out today from Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28, when he said, come unto me, all of you that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. And I want you to know this morning, it's because of the incarnation, the identification, and the illumination that a transformation takes place. John chapter 1, but to all who did receive him, 
to all that believed in his name. He gave the right to become children of God. Believe it. Receive it. Amen? Believe it and receive it. God will transform me through his illumination. I can believe and I can receive. So this morning we see the revelation of Jesus. But second of all, I want us to look at the rejection of Jesus. Look at verses 10 and 11. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own received him not. Now, I want you to pay very special attention to the very first sentence in verse 10. The world was made through him. Jesus created all things. He's the master of conception. He's the maker of creation. He's the mentor of consecration. I love the debates that take place between evolutionist and creationist. Sometimes it's kind of funny to listen to those people. They're, they're, they're kind of comical in a way if it wasn't so sad. You see, evolutionists tell us that their beliefs are based on reality. They tell us that they believe what they believe in evolution because it's an absolute fact. And they berate us because they say the only reason creationists believe what they believe is just by faith. Because we have the facts. Well, I want you to listen to me this morning. Here's the truth. All any of us have is faith. Those evolutionists cannot tell you where the first molecule came from that caused the Big Bang. They just have to have faith that there was a molecule. Amen? But they can't tell you where it came from. And listen to me, there wasn't one of those evolutionists that was there. Nobody saw it and they don't know. So they're just claiming to believe by faith. But oh, listen to verse 10. It's clear. It's precise. It confirms. Verse 10 says, the world was made through him. I have it on absolute fact in the word of God. That's where my world came from. And I want you to remember this. One day, the Big Bang Theory... Oh, this is going to surprise you now. Listen to me. The Big Bang Theory is going to be proven to be true. Oh, you didn't expect that, did you? Boy, it got quiet in here. You ought to see your faces. We got some faces out there kind of going. Listen, the Big Bang is going to be proven true. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 6. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, like the sound of mighty pails of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord God Almighty reigns. That's the big bang they're going to hear. Amen? That's the big bang when Jesus comes again, when they see Him on the portals of glory, when they hear the clouds erupt in adoration and love and grace and mercy presides and prevails. That's the big bang that will transform the universe. The second coming of Jesus Christ was written of by John the Revelator. And in Revelation chapter 19, he said, Blessed are those that are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's the big bang party of Jesus. Amen? Evolutionists don't believe God's word. And listen, I'm going to tell you this morning why they don't. It's the same reason that you don't. It's the same reason that I don't. If we don't believe, it's because we don't want to. Bottom line. We don't want to believe. Why do we not want to believe? Because it shines light on our sinful nature. 
If we believe in God, we have to come to grips with who we are. And listen, some of us need to come to grips with who we're not. Amen? We don't believe because we don't want to believe. We live in a world that has made creation its own malady. They reject the Creator. And verse 11 says, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. I want you to listen to this. Throughout the canon of God's word, Jesus fulfilled 330 direct prophecies of the Old Testament. 330. Multitudes and thousands saw his mysteries and his miracles. Humanity beheld his love and they saw his light. Yet verse 11 says, they did not receive him. Why? Why was he rejected and refused and reviled and restricted? The answer is simple, because they didn't want to. They didn't want to accept him. And hear me carefully this morning. If you leave here this morning, without accepting Jesus Christ. If he's not yours, if he's not in your heart, if he's not the God of your life, you'll leave here rejecting him because you want to. Not because you don't know. Not because it hasn't been shown to you. Not because he hasn't loved you. Not because he doesn't work in your life. Because you will make a conscious decision that you want to reject the light. The Bible says men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds are evil. The intent of their heart is continually corrupt. If you leave without Jesus, you've made a choice. You're choosing to reject him. You're choosing to refuse him. You're choosing to restrict him in your life. You're choosing to remove him from your daily activities. But Jesus proved his love over and over and over again. I want you to know this morning, Jesus is the way, but they wouldn't walk with him. Jesus is the truth, but they wouldn't believe in him. Jesus is the life, but they wanted to kill him. John 3.19. This is the judgment, the condemnation. The light came into the world, and people loved darkness rather than life because their deeds were evil. Here's a real profound statement for you. The opposite of truth is not error. The opposite of the truth is sin. Amen? This is the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And the opposite of the truth is sin in our life. James 4.17 says, Whoever knows to do the right thing and does it not, to him it is sin. Our schools are teaching our children that there's no creation, that we're a a random accident. Why? No God, no accountability. The world is programming our families, act like you want to, dress like you want to, drink like you want to, drug like you want to. Why? No God. No accountability. Why are we surprised when our children reject God? When they refuse to do what's good. When they revile godliness. Hear me carefully today. The good news of God's word says, I don't have to reject him. I can receive him. God's word says, for those who received him, gave them the power to become sons of God. Verse 12 says, believe and receive. So this morning we've seen the revelation of Jesus. We've seen the rejection of Jesus. And lastly, 
I want you to see the reception of Jesus. Look at verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory is the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is full of grace and truth. Praise God for the grace. What does grace mean? Let me put it to you simply. Grace means that I get what I don't deserve and I don't get what I do deserve. Amen? That's God's grace. And I can say with unwavering authority based on God's word, everybody here, everybody listening on the internet and watching, and everyone that ever will, has received God's grace. You're alive today by God's grace. You function by God's grace. You have your needs met by God's grace. You don't get what you deserve, and I don't either. Thank you, Lord. His grace, His grace gives me what I don't deserve. That's His love. That's the reception of, of Jesus Christ. It's not about attending church or going to Sunday school or being baptized or taking communion, giving your money, doing good works or living a good life. Listen, those are good things in and of themselves, but they don't buy you eternal life. When we believe in Him, when we receive Him, when we accept His promise, when we admit our problems, when we trust in His purpose, He makes us his very own. He takes us in his arms. He holds us. He protects us. Verse 16 says, For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace upon grace. Oh, Lord, am I thankful for his grace. I don't know where. I mean this when I tell you I don't know where I'd be. I don't think I'd be alive today. I really don't. His grace is upon His grace is upon His grace. Verse 17 says, The law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So listen to me. This morning, grace and truth is speaking. Grace and truth is speaking to me. Grace and truth is speaking to you. And if we leave here and we go on our way and we reject Jesus Christ, it will be only because we want to. That we make a decision that we don't want Him. That He's not important. That the issues that He gives us in His Word are not valid for our life. God forbid that we would reject the God that became a man. The God who chose to identify with Ashton, with Roscoe, with Kathleen, with Lynn, so that he could prove how much he loves us. From God to man. Do you see the revelation of Jesus? Will you shun the rejection of Jesus? Or will you select the reception of Jesus? Verse 12 gives us a glorious promise. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave them the right to become children of God. Let's stand together. Heavenly Father, you're glorious. You're mighty, you're wonderful. You're incredible in all your ways. My mind's not capable of understanding your mysteries. 
and understanding all the miracles that you were able to do. But Father, my mind can conceive of your love, of your light, of your leadership, what you did for me at the cross of Calvary. Father, I ask you this morning that nobody would leave this building unless they know in their heart that they have accepted Jesus Christ, the God who came down from heaven to become physical, to live among us, to live in us, and to live through us. Father, don't let us reject your Son, but have us to accept Him today. It's the most important decision will ever make. And I ask it in the name that is highly exalted above every name. The 100% God and the 100% man, Jesus Christ. 